April Prayer. How are you, April? I am wonderful. Your Thank defense you attorney. You're, okay, you're, I'm sorry. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off. It just came to my head. You're not a public defender. You are a defense attorney, correct? I'm a former public defender. That was my dream job, and I did it for six years, and I served proudly, and then I've been in private practice for 16 years. There we go. There we go. There we go. So I know, uh, Attorney Prayer, this is something that is near and dear to you, and uh, we have seen, again, so much uh, misinformation come out about this bill as we come closer to uh, its actual implementation in January. And so when you hear this type of headline from, again, Jim Durkin, the Safety Act gives drug cartels free reign in Illinois, what do you say to that or something like that, that type of thinking? Um, hearing all the misinformation is infuriating, and I think it's irresponsible that public officials are spouting such views and that prosecutors and law enforcement are spouting lies because what it comes down to is what the two of you were talking about before you brought me on is that cash bond punishes poor people who have only been accused of a crime, not found guilty of a crime. That's the significant part. And if you look at the American Bar Association, they released a statistic saying that approximately 500,000 people languish in jails across the United States pre-trial. Pre-trial, meaning there's been no plea, there's been no trial, and that 75% of them are there for nonviolent offenses, but all of them are there because they could not pay the bond. So back in my days when I was a public defender, you know, I started off in a misdemeanor courtroom and we had a heavy call and lots of people were there for stealing maybe a gadget out of Home Depot or stealing diapers out of Walgreens. And then we had a prostitution call back then when prostitution was actually criminalized. And people would sit in jail for months over a $100 bomb because everyone in their family, everyone in their peer group, Everyone who was near them could not post that $100 bond. And so to say that cash bond, I, I, I can't understate the fact that cash bond punishes poor people where wealthy people who are charged with heinous crimes would simply get to walk. But I think a lot of people misunderstand the purpose of bond. Bond has two purposes only, and one is to assure your your presence in court, Mm -hmm. and two is to protect the safety of, you know, the community. And judges will still be able to make that assessment under this new law. So I was reading an article that so appropriately came out just a couple of hours, like an hour ago, a couple of hours ago, where it is a fact check for the Safety Act. So they give different claims and they tell you what the fact is claim it ends cash bail and it does in fact attorney and cash bail correct it does Uh it does end cash bail now speaking to what you just said that ending cash bail is one thing but this has been weaponized and politicized to the degree that basically the second claim has been used a lot and that ending cash bail will release dangerous criminals into the community does that's this, the part that's false. That's the part that's false. So tell us how that does not happen. So what ha- and I don't, I, I think you got to explain what actually happens when somebody gets arrested. Okay, okay. When good. they get arrested, they get taken before a judge within 48 hours. That's just how it is now. They get taken before a judge. The judge hears from the state's attorney, hey, this is what the person's charged with. This is what's alleged. This is what their criminal background is. And this Then they hear from the defense attorney, this is the person's educational background, this is their family life, this is this is where they work, those sorts of things. And then the judge also receives a risk assessment. The risk assessment is this is how many times this person has missed court in the past. This is how many other felony convictions this person has. This and the judge considers all of those factors in setting a bond for that person. What will be taken out of that is the bond, but the judge still has many options at his or her disposal. They can hold them 
in custody with no bond, mm-hmm. which is what I suspect will happen with a lot of people who are charged with violent offenses. They will now have no bond, not meaning there's no bond. They can walk out the front door of Cook County Jail, meaning there's no amount of money they can pay to be released. That's mm-hmm. one option. They can give them a curfew. They can put them in, on electronic monitoring. And all the myths around electronic monitoring needs to be knocked down as well. People think that, oh, you're on the bracelet and then you're going to go and you're going to kill and maim and, and cause mayhem in the streets. When, according to Chicago Appleseed, they say less than, I believe, 4% of people, yeah, 4% of people on electronic monitoring in Cook County between 2016 and 2020 were rearrested on any new serious crime. Hold on so with us because I'm glad you're you're really giving the explanation of what actually happens with someone mm-hmm. when they are arrested. But then we also want to go into one of the other claims. Non-detainable offenses, which um, I've never really heard of that. So, <laughs> but that's something that they there is a phrase saying that anyone charged with a non-detainable offense will be released immediately after arrest. Having a conversation with attorney April Prayer about the Safety Act and what's true and what's not. Um, before we went to break, I just wanted to mention there is a small, uh, it said, they say conservative-leaning organization, WFCN News. It's not verified on social media. We don't know, but they're putting out this information that Illinois is creating what they're calling non-detainable offenses. And anyone charged with a, a quote-unquote non-detainable offense will be released immediately after arrest. On their graphic, they are showing these to be the non-detainable offenses beginning January 1st. Aggravated battery, aggravated DUI, aggravated fleeing, arson, burglary, drug-induced homicide, intimidation, kidnapping, robbery, second-degree murder, threatening a public official. Now, I have never heard of us creating anything like a non-detainable offense. Attorney, what, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, you're correct. That's actually what had me dig into this bill and really take a look at what the language said. So I started receiving that meme that you referenced on Facebook over and over and over again on Friday. I I, I got I got it texted to me, inboxed to me, people (laughs) asking me, is this true? And then I saw people posting it saying the purge is coming. And I I was like, it just didn't sound right. So then I actually went and read the law and I would encourage anybody within my voice to do the same thing. Law is not just for lawyers. You can go on there and read the language yourself and not simply rely on Facebook means from unknown, unreliable sources like a FC, WFCN. With that being said, there's no such thing as a non-detainable offense. Let me give this example. You can be picked up, say on that misdemeanor, so you stole some toothpaste from Walgreens. But guess what? When you stole some toothpaste from Walgreens, you already had a long record of missing court, and you got another case that you're fighting at the same time. The judge may very well hold you no bond just so that you can go in front of that other judge and explain how it is you have the audacity to pick up a second case. Mm -hmm. Now, is that on that long list of non-detainable offenses? No, but you can very well be detained for it because you're a flight risk. Obviously, people who are charged with murder, obviously uh, multiple murders, someone who's charged with being a sex offender with multiple victims, they're not simply going to be sleeping in their own bed the same night that they are arrested. That, I mean, we got to use a little bit of common sense. Even if you're not familiar with the actual law, you got to say, wow, judges and lawyers and legislators all sat down and said that this was okay for the purge to happen on January 1st. That is ludicrous. So, no, if you commit an arson, guess what? You're going to jail first. <laughs> yeah. Then you're going to trial and you're probably going to prison. So you're probably never going home again. So, no, this is just ridiculous. There's no such thing as a, a non-detainable offense. What will happen, so I told you how it works now, with bond hearings. What will happen come January 1st is if the state's attorney has a concern that you are a flight risk, if they have a concern that you that this is a heinous crime or this is some violent offense, they can request a hearing within 48 hours in front of a judge and they have to present clear and convincing evidence as to why you should be held, why you shouldn't simply be released on your signature, why you shouldn't be released on curfew, why you shouldn't be released on the bracelet. And they can put on a hearing, and the judge gets to hear all of that evidence. 
And so, no, you're not going to simply be released from the police station and say, well, we hope to see you in court, but we know you killed three people. It's ridiculous. So mm-hmm. people have to, I mean, I'm really amazed at how much honestly educated, um, reasonable black folks are eating this up hook, line, and sinker, and they don't see that this is a propaganda campaign, that this is a trick, that this is, these are tactics, and that these are lies that are meant to confuse and scare you. We are back on Afternoons with Egoin and Buchanan. On the live line with us right now is former public defender attorney April Prayer, and she is walking us through this safety act, helping us debunk some of the misinformation that's been going on about it. And just so you know, Attorney Prayer, you have the phone lines lit. So I want to bring, I want to ask you a real quick question and then get to these calls as soon as we can. Looking at this op-ed that I mentioned earlier in the conversation where he talks about drug cartels having free reign because of the Safety Act, I just want to read a a very short paragraph from it and get your thoughts. He, He goes on to say, Mr. Durkin, how does this affect the war on drugs? Under Pritzker Safety Act, it's possible drug kingpins, smugglers, traffickers, or distributors of illegal drugs won't be detained before trial, no matter the quantity of deadly substances they are accused of possessing. Astonishingly, Pritzker and the Democrats don't seem to believe there is a connection between drug dealers, street gangs, cartels, and the gun violence our state sees daily. It, where is he wrong? Um, I think all of it is wrong. I think all of it is pretty outrageous. So, like I said, judges still will have the same protections. They will still have the same options available to them in terms of pretrial detention in county jail, um, pretrial detention on electronic monitoring. There are a number of measures, a number of ways that you can be supervised while you are awaiting your trial. And what we find is that people, whether they are on bond or on EM, whether they are they have paid money or they have not paid money, they tend to come to court regardless of the crime they're charged with. People just it's, it's amazing. There's yeah. the studies show that they generally show up. Um, but I did want to counter with this with this quote I found. And this is by the past immediate president of the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police, quote, Let me make it clear to you that the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police is not against the Safety Act because we have put countless hours into collaborating with elected officials. And that comes from Hazel Press Police Chief Mitchell Davis, who was the uh, president of that organization at the time it was passed. I think we have this myth about prosecutors and law enforcement not being on board. They are on board because they Mm -hmm. help craft the doggone bill. I think we have to ask ourselves as a society a very fundamental question, and that is, is the is the fundamental purpose of jail to house people that have been convicted of a crime or have been accused of a crime? Right. And that's there seems to be some disconnect there because people at this point, they don't care. They just want jails to house people, whether they've been you know, convicted or not. And if ultimately if the purpose is to, again, house people that have been convicted, then then how can we not do this? How can we not reevaluate our current system? Yeah, I think there are two camps. I think that there's that camp that believes that. And I think most people just don't know. Right. I have people all the time say, well, you know, if I pay bills, my case over. (laughs) What? Your case is just getting started. Like, what are we talking about? Bail is just to assure your appearance in court. People think that if they pay their way out of jail, that they don't have to come back and that the case has gone away. So there's a lot of misinformation around the criminal justice system because, quite frankly, people don't care until it's their loved one whose livelihood is on the line. Well, these people want to talk to you, so I guess we can go ahead and go to the callers. Definitely. Let's go to Michael. Michael, you're on VON. Hey, guys. Hey, hey hello, Michael. Ms. April. So glad to hear you. You're so intelligent, and you even have a little levity in such a serious subject. <laughs> uh, I've had a chance to look at the bill, and these are problems nationwide. Uh, I wanted to ask you, don't you think more transparency about these judges? Because I've often wondered, um, or and I don't even use the word white people anymore. I just use Republicans or MAGA Republicans that are sitting on the bench. A lot of people don't know that Trump put in 55 federal judges in two years, 
three of them on the Supreme Court and President Obama in his whole eight years only put 54 judges on the federal bench. And so I want I think you're absolutely right when you talk about people don't know the law. The average person is going to have at least six or seven legal issues, whether it's a divorce or getting married or mm-hmm. child custody, all of these things, which I don't want to go into. But what do you think about having more transparency on these judges, especially when it comes to elections? And I would like to see if there is a pattern of practice of the same judges doing the same thing, allowing and basically perpetuating the myth and allowing these stereotypes to take place. And and so if you could speak on that, there's also the issue of attorney discipline, um, which is why I decided to go into law. And I'll just hang up and listen. Thank you. Go right ahead, April. I think, yeah, thank you so much for your questions and your comment. That, that was absolutely brilliant. So, yes, I, I think that there have been strides made around transparency around the judges that are currently sitting. And I, I will give Kim Fox credit for that. So a few years ago, she released data that hadn't been released before, and that was on, I believe, all the sentencing um, that each judge sitting on the bench had done on each specific type of crime, and and it was broken down by race. And that had never been released before. And so then we were able to see, well, who is the harshest sentencer in Cook County, and who does sentence black defendants more harshly than white defendants for the same crime. And that data had not been available before. But yes, there can be more data released along those same lines. Um, and But the other, the flip side is that most voters don't care. Again, most people don't care about judges. They don't care about the criminal justice system. They don't care about the civil justice system until they or their livelihood or their liberty is on the line. And so that's how so many people roll up to the polls and they have a list of 50 judges and they either mark no for all of them, mark yes for no all of them, or they skip them all. They research two at best. And that's how we continue to get the same judges retained over and over because nobody takes the time to actually look and see, oh, this person was sanctioned five years ago for lying to the judge. Oh, this, this person got in trouble seven years ago for hiding evidence from the other side. Nobody looks into that, and we simply vote blindly, and that's the main problem. Seven seven three five nine one sixteen ninety. Tony, Terry, Al, Princess, Melinda. We're going to take your calls and more. We're talking about the Safety Act and what is true, what is not true about the Safety Act. We're going to take your calls. Al, you're on VON. Thank you for se- taking my call. Yes. I've been sitting here and stuff. Uh, uh, I, my, my comment is uh, this: the cartel is is our number one problem in uh, urban Black America, and has always been. Uh, okay. People that uh, have got rich throughout this pandemic, I know personally. I have three or four buddies that, that put up a mass of wealth, pretty much a retirement, selling drugs. And I'm not talking about $50,000. i am talking about $800,000 in a shoebox. Okay. I, I said here right now, listening to the show, uh, uh, three, uh, three dope things pull up. I'm watching them. One of them jumps out. I'm at CVS. He runs in with a bag, comes out with a, a garbage bag full of stuff in a shopping cart. They speed off. Okay, so t- about the Safety about Act. My question, here's my question. Yeah. How can you trust this Public Safety Act when we release more criminals over this last three years to commit uh, more offenses uh, in our lifetime? And I want to thank you for that. Attorney, do you have any response? Are you there? You might be muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I was muted. Okay. I, I don't have a response. <laughs> okay. No problem, because I, we were trying to get to, you know, the actual discussion at hand. Tony, you're on VON. Thanks, Kim, for taking my sure. call. Uh, hello, Ativa. Hey. You know, when you say aggravated battery, a weapon's involved in that, and that's a no-cash uh, bond. Also, trespassing. The new thing that's going on, I, we, I just recently uh, purchased property. People will come and live in your building without your knowledge, and you have to take them to court to remove them from your premises. Okay. And they're talking about they're just going to give them a ticket. They're just going to give them a ticket, but they can't remove them from your property. Uh, does that fall under the safety act, no, uh, no. <laughs> attorney? Well, there, that, that's a myth, too. So there, there was, um, I guess, a prosecutor who went to the air and said, no, a cop who went on air and said that he couldn't remove people for trespassing. First of all, you're conflating two different things. So I've had squatters, too. I, I'm a landlord as well. Mm-hmm. You also can't have squatters removed by the police. So that's not how that works. You do have to handle that in civil court. 
So that is no different. So what they're saying now is that there's a, this allegation that they won't be able to arrest. There's nothing stopping police from, a, from making an arrest for anything that is illegal. That mm-hmm. has not changed. The Safety mm-hmm. Act doesn't take that away. All right. Terry, you're on VON. Uh, good afternoon. How you guys doing today? Good. good afternoon. You know, it is my uh, question. Um, what you know, this is nothing new from my from what I can see. Uh, you know, it's probably named differently and worded differently. But I remember during the pandemic, uh, a lot of young men were getting that same treatment, uh, committing offenses, and um, getting let up on uh, minor. I think there was a, like a big outbreak in the prison and on uh, the county, and they couldn't sit, so they let them go. Okay. So that, I mean, that's pretty much the same thing. And you know, you have people now that are in hot spots. And, you know, they have social media and different apps that show exactly where crime is happening. And, you know, a lot of the people that commit these crimes in these certain areas are repeat offenders. Okay. And they continually keep getting out. So the thing is, if it's up to the judge to determine who's a public threat and who's not, what exactly is that judge looking at? Because so far from what we've seen, a lot of these offenders, and we can look them up ourselves, they be having a, a real long rap. Okay, and, and we get what you're saying, Terry. So basically, um, but hasn't it always been up to the judge to decide that, attorney? It has been up, it has been up to the judge to decide that, but before what they were considering was uh, one question that each judge would ask is how much can your client pay? Yeah. How much can right. this defendant pay to be released? That is being removed, so people won't be punished and won't be sitting in jail a thousand dollar bond, a hundred thousand dollar bond, a million dollar bond, because they can't pay it, while somebody else of means would be able to pay the same thing for the exact same crime. Got it. That's the significant difference. And very quickly, isn't it possible for people to have committed like smaller crimes, misdemeanors, serve the appropriate time for whatever the crime was, and thus they have a long rap sheet, which is different than the idea that people are just being let go for, for committing multiple crimes. Like some, like some of these people with multiple crimes served all their time, so there's nothing more you can do. But they're, they're, he, I, I don't think he's talking about misdemeanors. So I think people are scared that crimes that involve violence, mm-hmm. that those individuals will not, they will be turned back on the streets to commit another crime. That's what people are scared about. And what you're saying, attorney, is that that's a very small percentage. But, you know, when you see it on the news, it looks like it's everybody's out here. The, there was a man who just, you know, and, and, and it's per, it, it becomes personal. You'll take an example. There was a man. I don't even remember. It just happened last week. He, he killed someone. He had just gotten out after serving 22 years and went and killed somebody. And that's like, just I, happened. Right. And that's what I'm saying. He served his time, and then he committed again. That happens. But what can we do about? I mean, he served 22 years, right? And that's just you're one talking of the, about the jogger. You're talking about the jogger. In yes, in Memphis, Memphis. That, right? Yeah, right, right, yes. Right. He, he, you're correct. He had gone to prison for the same thing. He served 22 or 24 years. He had been out a very short time period, and this time he killed his victim as opposed to releasing them, which is what happened the first time. And that turns into so, everybody yes. soft on crime. That, that's what, you know what I mean? So I don't know how you it, solve it, a problem like that. That's, that's the problem. I mean, you can't, you, you can't get, get ahead of human behavior all the time. That man has served his 24 years. He didn't take a life the first time. He has served all of his time on that crime, got out, and he made the bad decision to do it a second time and this time to make it even worse by killing the person. Yeah. So you're not going to ever be able to control that. I don't, I don't know if mental illness is a factor. I don't know enough about that case to comment. But I don't know if mental illness is a factor. Well, And the, it sounds like the two people knew each other. <laughs> so just throw that in there. The person he kidnapped actually knew the person who he killed. So it might be anything. We, we don't know. But, look, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on and discussing all of this. How do people find you if they need your services? Oh, wonderful. Thanks for asking. So I'm really vocal on Facebook and Instagram. They can just go to at J-U-S-T-U-S-J-U-N-K-I-E, Justice Junkie. I spell justice a little bit differently because there is no justice. There's just us. J-U-S-T-U-S-J-U-N-K-I-E. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.